looking for truth from God's Word that you can understand and apply to your life? You'll find it today on Make It Clear with Dr. Stan Pons. Listen now as Stan makes it clear. In it, we read that Jesus is the Lord, that he died on the cross, he rose again from the dead. It's not by good works, it's by faith alone. We know the truth. All right, now we place our faith in Christ. So now the Spirit comes inside of us so we can begin to know the Word. So those of you that are going through troubled times, all I want you to know is you can trust this book here as being infallible and sufficient for what God wants us to know so that you can go to this for truth to be able to handle whatever you're going through for the troubled life. Secondly, it's going to sound like preacher talk here, but to the degree you do not know the word, to the degree you do not study it, no amount of illumination that God will provide for you will ever give you something that you haven't heard or read or even studied from God's word. You cannot take a tool out of your toolbox, no matter how much you know the tools are to be in toolboxes, and be illuminated to know that that's a great toolbox, and tools are really great, and tools can be used to build things, if you don't put the tool in the toolbox to start with, to be able to pull it out. Let me just say it real simple for folks like me. Here it is. You'll never remember something that you never learned to start with. Do you all understand, understand what I'm saying? That's why... Again, I said it's preacher talk, but I love you. You need to be in God's Word by yourself every day for a reasonable amount of time to learn this book. And you might have all these little um, Hershey bar books. Hershey bars are all wrapped up. They taste real sweet. They're kind of good. You like them. We call them devotionals. We produce them. We put them out. But that's not the, the depth of it. That's about the Word written by man, put in a little package for us. You need to open up this book. Get yourself a good, good, literal translation, maybe a couple other translations around it. Get some commentaries and know this book. I promise you that we will all go through troubles as the sparks fly upward. And so we will need His Word to encourage us. Now, once that happens, now the Holy Spirit, watch this, has been given the tool of the Word to be able to give back to you that reminder of whatever you're going through. So, get alone in the book. Guys with guys and gals with gals. Get into a mentoring discipleship time together. Number three, get into a small group where iron sharpens iron. We can kind of work together with one another in that group. As long as you put the Bible on top of the book, the study book, and not the study book on top of the Bible. Those of you that are going to be looking for a church because you're moving around with military or job changes or whatever, find a church that teaches the Word of God verse by verse, sometimes word by word. Get into a church that will teach you the Word so that now the Holy Spirit can take that Word. There's a primary interpretation, but there's multiple applications so that you'll know the Word. Some preachers preach more applications than they preach the interpretation. And now we skew the interpretation by emphasizing an application that's really not an interpretation. I'm not going to ask you if you got all that, but I think you did. You want to know the book. So he will remind you of these great truths. And he says, in all that I said to you, I hope that you would really just rest in the promise of his most precious word. Well, I could say more, but I think it's time for us to move to the next point. And I want you to know this is kind of coming almost to the end here as he's bringing his final teaching of all this this time together, and he says this, I give you peace. So if you will, follow along in verse 27, at least the first part of it. It says, Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. And then he says, Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. You heard that I said of you, da-da-da-da-da. I think that second part of verse 27, in my opinion, would be better at the beginning of verse 28. But let's go back to the beginning of verse 27. He says, peace, I live with you. I started to think a great deal about the peace and what the Bible has to say about peace and what about the world that we're living in. I went to a book that was called The Lessons of History, written by Will and Ariel Durant. And their statistics tell me this, that in the last 3,500 years, there have only been 300 years when there weren't wars going on on planet Earth. Now think about it, 3,500 years of humanity... Before Christ, 1,500 years before Christ, all the way to the present, there was only 300 years when there wasn't war. 
they went on to say that in the last 5,500 years, there have been 14,000 wars, not battles, not skirmishes, but wars, multiple battles wrapped up into a war, 14,000 of them. And according to their study, they said there were in those 5,500 years, as a result of those wars, there were over four and a half billion casualties. So we see a lot of man's inhumanity to man and certainly no peace. If I bring it into today's life, I'm not very old and some of you have lived a lot longer than I have and you've seen and been in war and I haven't been. But in my opinion, as I read the newspaper and as I hear the news, it seems like this world is the most agitated I have ever seen. And if they're not in war, they're the closest to the next World War III that I've ever experienced. If, if, if you believe anything in Bible prophecy and ex eschatology, we have to believe that we are living in the last days. At least we can kind of see now that we're approaching it with what's going on in the Middle East alone. You then take your eyes and you sweep it across the globe and you look in Africa. We've been so distracted in the Middle East, we've overlooked what's going on in Africa. You see what's percolating in Asia right now with China and Taiwan and Japan and Korea. You can see they may not be at war yet, but I'm telling you it is so close it's about ready to explode. You bring that across into America today and what you're seeing just in our own political arena. I've never seen our country closer to what we might be thinking about is uh, not that it will happen, but maybe even kind of a civil war or at least some insurrection going on, some disruption and riots in our own country. So we're living in a day when there's not a lot of normal peace. So I did a little study on peace, and here's what I found. There are three basic kinds of peace. One word that we use a lot in the Old Testament for the word peace, those of you know the Old Testament and the Jewish word for peace, what is it, everyone? Shalom, okay? That basically means peace. That was a greeting, shalom. In the New Testament, the Greeks would greet one another with the word grace. And so that's why many of the writers of the New Testament would say, grace and peace unto you. Grace for the Greeks, peace for the Jews, but it basically meant the same thing. It was a greeting that they would use to one another. What word would we say to one another here? Anyone? Aloha. It's like breathing life. It's like breathing health. It's like breathing energy. It's kind of like that peace thing, that your life would be still and stable and full of joy. All right? That would be our greeting. That's a greeting. The second time we see a peace... And that's when there's an absence of strife. A moment ago I talked about strife between nations. In reality you have strife between people. You see that between husbands and wives. You see that between kids, brothers and sisters. And you see that between families. You see that on the job. You see that in churches unfortunately. You see it all over the place where there's a lot of strife. And of course you add that strife, man as an enemy of God. And the strife that you get into that spiritual realm. And then you have the next and final kind of peace... And that's the kind of peace, now watch this, this is a little different than what you think I'm going to say. It is not the absence of strife now. This kind of peace is a stability and contentment in the very midst of conflict. That's the kind of biblical peace that Jesus Christ is talking about. There will come a day, we know, that we won't have the strife between humanity. It'll end between God and man. And when you don't see nations at war, so there will be the absence of that conflict. But today we won't see that. He never promised that in this life now. But he has promised us a de degree of contentment that we have. Hold your place here for just a moment. And I'd like you to just go a couple books over to the right to the book of Philippians for a moment. I want you to see it as it's just described by Paul. As I looked at one of the primary writers, not authors, but writers of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul, his life was known for conflict even when he was a kind of the head Jew and he was going around persecuting Christians. There was a lot of seeing families all distressed because of what he was doing by taking them and throwing them in jail and persecuting them and slaughtering them and martyring them. He even held the garments of the guys who killed Stephen. So he was all midst of all that strife. Then he becomes a Christian. It didn't end there for him. It just changed directions and it now headed directly toward him. And his whole life was filled with that. Plus, because of him taking a stand, he also had to suffer at the result of humans, even... Um, Natural elements thrown in the deep, all right? Shipwrecked, all of that. Now, I said all that to say 
This is the man, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he writes this in Philippians chapter 2. Um, what a, a neat passage. And I, I don't know, maybe it'll speak to you like it does me. Excuse me, Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Philippians 4. If you like 2, you'll really love chapter 4. <laughs> All right, verse 11 says this. Not that I speak from want, for I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. Let me pause for a moment. Sometimes peace can be truth that you hear and you know, but you have to learn that peace and what it's all about. So contentment, you might know about it, but you have to learn to be content. He goes on to say, in whatever circumstance I am. So no matter what's happening, all the trouble externally, inside I can have comfort. Verse 12, I know how to get along with humble means, and I also know how to live in prosperity. In every, in every circumstance, that's what you should have underlined, I've learned the secret of being filled and going hungry, both of having abundance and suffering need. What do you think that secret is? Wouldn't you like to know it? It's found in verse 13. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Now, we have that verse emblazoned on our Bible when you have it engraved, and some of you have that as a plaque on your wall. I can do all things through Christ. That doesn't mean you're going to be able to bound over a building in a single leap. It doesn't mean you're going to be able to fly or go as fast as a speeding bullet. It does mean this, that no matter what you're going through, watch this now, you can do that. You can experience that. You can go through that through His strength, not through your strength. Which brings us full circle to this peace that he promises to give to you. Leave your place in Philippians and now if you will go to Ephesians chapter 2. This is where I want you to get. Ephesians chapter 2. Remember what we read here about how that he promises us peace. Ephesians chapter 2. If you have your pens ready, you might want to underline this. Chapter 2 verse 8. Paul is now speaking. He says, For by grace have you been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So getting saved is by faith, not by works. So now you know Christ is Savior. Verse 14. For he Christ, verse 13 referring to Christ, himself is our peace. Circle that. He's the peace. He's the author of peace. He's the generator of peace. He's the giver of peace. Who made both groups one and broke down the barrier between the dividing wall. Verse 15. By abolishing in his own flesh the enmity, which is the law of commandments, contained in ordinances, so that himself he might make two into one new man, which would be the church, thus establishing peace. So, verse 14, he is our peace. Verse 15, he establishes that peace. Then in verse 17 it says, And he came and he preached peace to you who are far away, and peace to those who are near. That means Jews and Gentiles, both. He preached peace wherever he went. So he's the author of peace. He establishes peace and is a communicator of peace. It all comes from the Lord. Let's go back to John 14. So now, in order for us to have comfort, we're going to get that comfort from Him. John chapter 14. Now let's go with the passage and I'll bring this message now, hopefully, to a a reasonable close. He says, Peace I leave you, because He's leaving. My peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. So His peace is found in the person of Christ, the Holy Spirit. In God, it is revealed in his word. So as he provides that for us as the source, so he is the peace, but he is also the truth. That's why he ends this chapter by saying, do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. Now I'm going to read the next three verses because I want you to see what validates comfort for the troubled heart. He says this, you heard that I said to you, I go away. It doesn't mean I go to Jerusalem. It means I go away. But I'll come to you again. So I'm going to the cross. I'm going to die, but I'm going to come back to you again. That's what's implied here as we know through the rest of Scripture. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I go to my Father. For the Father is greater than I am. And you could add the word for for greater than I am right now because he was limited in his physicalness, but he was still equal to God. Verse 29. Now I have told you before it happens. In other words, I'm telling you ahead of time. I'm going to go away, but I'm going to come back. It's going to happen at the cross. Don't worry about it. So that when it happens, you're going to believe. And my, did they believe when they finally saw Jesus alive again. Verse 30. I will not speak much more with you. In other words, my teaching time on earth is coming to a close. For the ruler of the world is coming. That means Satan is now going to be unleashed on him. Especially when he's hanging on the cross at that very moment. Where he says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And he has nothing in me. Verse 31. 
He says, but so that the world may know that I love the Father, I do exactly as the Father commanded me. And he ends by saying, get up, let us go from here. Well, I want to close by this. So listen carefully. This is a beautiful presentation by the Lord about not letting your heart be troubled. A tremendous teaching of five weeks just on the multiple ministry of the Holy Spirit and how it relates to you and me. Now he's going to validate all of this by saying, I'm going to the cross I'm going to come back again. I'll show myself to you. Even if the world comes to me, when the world comes to me, it will not have control over me because I'm going to do what the Father tells me to do because the Father sent me in the world that I could save the world. And so I've come into the world to follow what the Lord told me to do. So Jesus is doing all of that. That resurrection, now watch this, watch this, watch this. Because Jesus rose again from the dead validates the point that everything that he just taught about comfort for the troubled heart must be true because as much as he promised that he was going to come back and then he did, that validates it. Now that means that he is who he claimed to be and he's not a liar because he didn't lie about his death and resurrection. That means that whatever comfort that you need is going to be found in the person of Jesus Christ. You can go back over all those notes that we've covered, all the teaching of Jesus. I want you to know... His resurrection, seal that deal for you and me. So you are not believing in some bit of spiritual platitude, some little cliche, some little stuff you get out of a magazine. You are listening to the very words of God communicated to you and me. Now for those of you that are on the other side of Christianity and you're kind of peering in, you're hearing a real story of Christianity. We will cry. We will bleed. We will hurt. We will die even though we're Christians. But those who are Christians who are choosing to now embrace this truth, we will have comfort when we go through these things. We will will not deny the pain or what caused us the pain, but we will give God all the glory for what He has done. And we look back to not only that Jesus died and He rose again, but whatever He did, He did it because He was obeying the Father to love you and me. So when he went to the cross, it wasn't like this poor guy who was going to start this religion. He got martyred at the end, and everybody now worships him because he died, and oh, he started this new thing. No, he did that on the cross, and he didn't need to because he took your sin and my sin on himself. He paid for that sin debt. He rose again from the dead, authenticating what he did for us on the cross and the payment for sin. And now he offers to you and me the free salvation if we simply place our faith in Him. So folks, if you hear anything, yeah, you don't go to hell. Yep, you go to heaven. But more than that, you have a relationship with Jesus Christ and you have all the blessings of the Godhead for you and me. So folks, I pray that as you drive home and you go back into this hustle and bustle in the wild, wicked world out there, you will worship and love the Lord and it will show in an obedient life because you trusted in Him as your personal Savior. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes and just take a moment and really worship Him? In a few moments, I'm going to bring this teaching to a close with a prayer. But I want to give you some ideas with your heads bowed and eyes closed. I do that so you won't be looking around and be distracted by people packing up their Bibles and doing whatever they're doing to get up to leave. I'm doing that so that this moment you would have in in an almost distractionless time and environment. First of all, are you absolutely certain of going to heaven when you die? Are you absolutely certain that you will live forever with Jesus Christ? If you're not certain, it's quite probable that you won't spend eternity with Him. And so I'd like to remind you what Jesus said in the same chapter. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He also said for those that believed on him, they had the Holy Spirit. They would get the Spirit. And so belief gives you the Spirit. And if he sent you to hell now, once you trusted in Christ, he'd be sending his Holy Spirit to hell with you. And he cannot do that. So when you trust Christ as your Savior, you receive the Spirit. You have been born again. You have a new life. It is Christ's life. You've accepted Christ. You've accepted God. And now he that has the Son has life. And you now have eternal life. Now my friend, I pray that you'd realize that no amount of good works, as nice as they are, as good as they are, as hard as you work, as long as you've worked, whether they're religious or social, that Jesus says, I don't look on any of those deeds to get you to heaven. Because if I looked on those deeds, then my son didn't have to go to the cross. If you think it's by trusting Christ and doing good deeds, then you're saying that 
my son's death on the cross wasn't good enough and you have to help him out. You have to come to him without relying upon anything other than the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And he says, now you got it. I'll give to you eternal life. I now will abide with you. You will never perish. You will have everlasting life. Because you came to me through my door, not your door of good works. Now my friend, how to make that real is just simply say to the Lord, he already knows your thoughts. You're transferring your trust from yourself or anything to Christ and Christ alone. And you're saying, Lord, I believe you died for me and you rose again. And I'm trusting in you now as the one who'd forgive me of all my sins. Now once you trust in him, you're sealed with the Spirit of God. So when you have those dark days of doubts, that doesn't mean you lose it. It doesn't mean you have to keep on believing, 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 believing to stay saved. Once you're saved, you are born again. You don't ever get born again and again and again and again and again. And once you're born again, you can't get unborn again. So you get born again by believing in Christ and that deal is sealed. Please trust Christ. Come into that room, into that family of God and then enjoy all the blessings that he gives to you which is comfort for a troubled heart these ways. Now brothers and sisters in Christ, I know you know that and many of you probably knew a lot of these truths. I'm going to dip my arrow in as much honey as I can. But if that's the case, why are you still so agitated? Why are you still so worried? Why are you still so troubled about stuff? When you do that, is it possible that you might be manifesting some issues to non-Christians that will make them not want to trust Christ? When it's really not God's fault that you have a troubled heart? When you've chosen to have a troubled heart because you haven't gone to him for the one who will calm the troubled heart. Now, I'm not here. I don't want to, I don't put you on a guilt trip, but I just want you to know that I love you and I want you to think more deeply. Now, you can jump to some reason and say, well, it's a chemical imbalance and I didn't take this and it's my childhood and it's blah, blah, blah. I know all of that is out there. I realize that. But why do you still have a troubled heart? You don't have to any longer. Jesus spoke those truths to guys that are going to be sent out into a world of conflict. Now you have those truths on your lap in your Bible. Take them and put them into your mind. Let the Spirit of God bring a conviction to know and to apply those truths. Love Him with all of your heart. Do what He tells you to do. Allow Him to live His life out through you. Serve Him. In other words, engage in the Word of God. And then you can authentically, and in some cases easily, show to the world that no matter how much hell breaks loose, you still have that calmness that's there. I'm staking my reputation that this works on Christ. I believe it does. And I don't regret it for a moment. Why don't you trust Him right now? Maybe you need to tell Him, Lord, I'm sorry. I've, I've walked around with anxiety and fears and troubles and it seems like the next bird that flies in my window I'm just all upset and that's wrong I'm modeling that in front of my kids and I'm creating the next generation of emotional people that go up and down and I need to be the rock now in Christ and let him be the rock through me so I'm confessing that I'm that way so Lord I know that part of it is I haven't been in your word and therefore you want to teach me, but I gotta I gotta listen to your word. So you can't teach if my ears are closed or clogged. So Lord, I'm gonna get into your word. I'm gonna let you redirect me by loving you and obeying your commands. And, and, and Lord, I'm relying on you to remind me because I'm so weak at this. I'm st- I'm learning how to walk with contentment, like Paul talked about. But I'm still struggling. I've been doing this so long, it's a habit for me to be agitated. It's a habit for me to react as soon as something happens. So Lord, I want you to teach me and remind me. And I'm going to lean on you because I know that's the life I want. Well, that's for believers because now you have the power to do that in the Spirit. Now you on the other side, are you ready to call upon the name of the Lord? Just simply say, Lord, I'm trusted in you. And Jesus says, I forgive you. You're in my family and you have all of this waiting for you, all this peace because I am the source of peace. I'll establish it in your heart and I'll preach peace through you to others so you can teach them about my peace. 
You're listening to Make It Clear with the teaching of Dr. Stan Pons, founder of Make It Clear Ministries. Make It Clear is dedicated to taking the Word of God with clarity into every person's world. It is the support of listeners like you who make the ministry of Make It Clear possible. You can provide your tax-deductible gift to Make It Clear online by going to makeitclear.org. Or you can mail your gift to Make It Clear, P.O. Box 607-901, Orlando, Florida, 32860. Thank you for helping us Make It Clear. If you would like to have Dr. Pond speak at your church or event, please send us an email at tellmemore at makeitclear.org. Thank you, and remember to make it clear. Thank you.